And if you open up to the book of Revelations at the end, um, it says that, that they defeated the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus, and the word of their testimony, which is their story. So Jesus plus their story is the way that we can defeat the enemy so that more and more people may know and acknowledge the truth of Jesus and who he is. So this is important. This is why we're reflecting upon this as a community and um, that we're getting into this. Um, we gave you a note card about a couple weeks ago. And um, on this note card, um, it talked about, it said, hey, I wanted to be able to, I decided to start. Um, I, start, I decided to stop. And then today we're going to be talking about um, deciding to stay. Um, but also the beautiful thing about our story as well is that and if you reflect back, there's probably a lot of brokenness. Um, and what I've been, when I've been with our fellow TSM students, we're saying, hey, you know, God uses our sin, our brokenness for his glory. And the best way that I've been describing it to them is saying, hey, you are a masterpiece. So in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this from the New Living Translations, where we are God's masterpiece and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things that he has planned for us long ago. We are his masterpiece. So whether you think that your story is not good enough or it's too jacked up or too messed up, God says, no, no, no. I'm going to make you into something greater. I'm going to make you into a masterpiece. And I'm not going to say too much about that because God's going to be preaching about that next week. But the beautiful imagery that I've been sharing with our students with the masterpiece is, have you ever seen a mosaic before? All right, it's, it's little pieces of tile or glass, and they're, they're shattered, and they're broken. But the really cool thing about the mosaic is if you gather the pieces together, it forms some of the most beautiful artwork around. In fact, we see it in uh, cathedrals. We've seen it in museums. We've even seen it in furniture where it looks really cool and trendy and you can make something beautiful. And yet God takes the brokenness of who we are and makes us into a masterpiece. So this is why our story is important. This is why it's important for us to say, hey, we need to start something. Hey, this is why it's important we say, hey, it's, it's important to stop, whatever that may be. And even today, we're looking at the book of Ruth and saying, hey, it's, it's important for us even to stay. So let's open up that book. I'm going to summarize what is going on through this chapter. And um, if you uh, read this before, we're going to go through a quick review but there are two main characters um, we have in this, um, to start off this particular passage. We have Naomi and her husband, okay? And what happened was they had two sons, and they decided um, that they needed to move away because there was famine. They said, hey, this place is not good for us to be right now in our hometown, which is Bethlehem. Let's move to Moab, and we'll settle our family there, and uh, we'll make our home to be there. We'll start there. So they, they actually decided not to stay, and they went to this new place. And, you know, their family soon grew, and, and then their, their two sons met two women. Uh, two women named Ruth, which is actually the main character of our story, and the other one is Orpah, all right? Now, quick fact. Uh, I just learned this the other day, and I thought this was really interesting, okay? Um, you know Oprah? She was actually named after Orpah. Um, what happened was she was um, born, and, and the birth certificate, they spelt it wrong. And so then they spelled her name to be Oprah instead of Orpah. So you're welcome. It would have been the Orpah Winfrey Show, and now we have Oprah. So really her name was named after that. So we have Ruth and we have Orpah that married their two sons. And uh, they, you know, they had a happy family. Things were looking good. You know, crops were great. The family business, I'm sure, was great. And then all of a sudden, Naomi's husband passed away. And that's okay, because there's still the two sons to be able to take on the family business, the family trade. Everything was hopefully going to be okay. And, you know, things were moving around. And next thing you know, we find out shortly in the story that both the sons passed away. So we have Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. All right, And so if you know anything about these times, if the men were to be passed away, um, the, the women had nothing. 
Uh, they were to become beggars because they couldn't get jobs. They couldn't have anything. They was basically, their lives were miserable. It was going to be hopeless. And uh, that was probably going to be the end of it all. So Naomi, you know, gives both of these women the option saying, hey, um, this, you know, this has happened. So what you really should do, you should go back to your families in Moab and, and, and maybe you can remarry. Maybe you can find a new husband or maybe your parents will still take care of you. Um, because if you were to stick with me, like you are going to become a beggar and you, you're going to have nothing. So they, he, she gave the women those options, and Orpah, um, you know, probably smart, said, okay, deuces, I'm out of here. You know, like, I'm, I'm going to go back to my family. I'm, I'm hopefully going to make a, a, you know, like, this is a horrible thing that happened, but, like, you know, hopefully things will change. And then there's Ruth, all right? And um, she, it's incredible that she says something that's quoted by, Many different people, if you go to wedding ceremonies, this Bible passage is quoted often, which kind of is weird because it's really a conversation between two ladies, but, you know, a, a mother and a daughter, but, like, but it, there's still sacrificial love that is going on right here. And so in Ruth chapter 1, uh, when it was given to Naomi, I mean, when it was given to Ruth the option to be able to leave and go back home, Naomi, she responds by saying this. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death pass me from you. And when, when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Let me give you a modern day translation. This, my friends, is a mic drop. And Naomi, all my older friends, like, what's that right there? It, it, it's basically like, it's like, it's good. It's like, it's, that's the most perfect thing to say. It's so beautiful, like nothing else can be said. And Naomi has no other words and says, okay, you're coming with me and we're going to Bethlehem. So that's where their hometown was. They go to Bethlehem, just so happened, the same place where Jesus were to be born uh, much, much later. And, um, and, and so they're there, and Naomi, I mean, Ruth knows that she is probably going to be a beggar for the rest of her life. Um, and so they, they, they go around, and they go into the fields and where the workers were at, and they would go there at the end of the day, and typically, if you were to be a beggar, you would, like, look for the scraps that they missed and everything on the ground and, and pick up those things so that way you'd be able to survive. And, I mean, again, this is what Ruth chose. She said, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this life with you because I love you. You know, we're in this together. Like, she, she had every way out, but she decided to do this, and so she's picking up scraps, okay? Now, the interesting thing here is if you were to do that, especially if you were a woman, there would be some sort of payment back if you were to do that. Usually it would be something very sexual or physical, um, or you would have to pay money to be able to get into the fields to do that. So it was very shady. It was very awful. That was, she was the lowest of the lows, and there was just no way for her to get out of it. Okay? Now, what's really interesting was Ruth was in a field where there was a man named Boaz. Okay? And so we have Boaz, who actually is a, a relative of the family, you know, was a relative of Naomi's father-in-law. And, um, and, and basically, um, he heard about Naomi's story. All right? He heard what she had done. And she, he was like so like, appalled, like, wow, like why would anyone do something like this? So what he did, he commanded his men, said, do not touch this woman, and whatever she needs, let her pick it up and use for her own good, so that way she would be able to survive. Okay? When, when Boaz approached Naomi and, and said these things, Naomi, I mean, when Boaz approached Ruth, sorry, when Boaz approached Ruth, Ruth's like, why would, why would, why would you do this? Like, why? Why would you have favor in me? And this, is, this was, was Boaz's response right here. Boaz said this. He said, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. 
and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done with the full reward by giving you the by be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Incredible story. Um, and, and later on, we find out that Boaz um, actually takes Ruth and uh, shows her even more love and takes her into the family and marries her. And what we also learn from there is that she, that family becomes one of the direct descendants for David and eventually Jesus. So a beautiful story of a, uh, of a woman who had nothing that saw her mother-in-law and said, hey, you know, I, where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I'll die. I'm going to be with you. So a woman who had nothing had completely, um, all of a sudden, almost had everything. Boaz was a very rich, a very wealthy man. Um, this was something that was so crazy. Boaz heard her story, and he was changed. He was changed. And, 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 and we hear about that, and we see and it's something that's really good right there. So I get it. Usually when tough circumstances come our way, our first reaction is, where do we need to go next? You know, what's, what's the next big move? What needs to change? Where do we need to move? What is the next job? You know, our relationship. Maybe I need out of this particular marriage because it's, it's so bad because we're just not getting along anymore. And it's just, if you only knew, like, I, I have to get out. But yeah, there are some moments where God calls us to, to leave certain situations. But guess what? Guess what? There are even moments where he is calling us to stay put, okay? Where it's just like, hey, tough it out, you know, and you never know what could possibly happen next, okay? Um, I don't know if you all know this, but um, I was a football player in high school, all right? And um, had a lot of pride in that, um, our team was really good, had a lot of accomplishments. I had some individual accomplishments. In fact, when I first started dating Kyrie, um, I took her to my high school, and I wanted her to see my picture on the wall, right? Because she's definitely going to want to marry this guy if she sees my picture on the wall, right? Like, super impressive. You know, and, and so like, hey, you know, look at me. Like, I was one of the top athletes, and she was really nice about it at first. <laughs> Like, she, she, she smiles, like, oh, that's great. Now she probably would just roll her eyes and say, you know, show me how good you're at doing the dishes or something like that. You know, it's just like, you know, I moved on in life, right? And so, like, but, like, football was, like, a thing that was, like, my everything. You know, I just put my, my heart into it. Um, I was proud of that. Um, and, and luckily, I... I I started to realize it wasn't everything in my life towards the end, and, and God was actually moving me into ministry, and so I was going into a school to do ministry, and I was really excited about that, and so I go to I, I'm at my, my school uh, freshman year, and um, they just so happened to have a football team, all right? But if you know anything about the school that I went to, at the time, like ESPN did a power ranking of the worst five teams in Division Three football, and that was my school, okay? Like, we were the worst, all right? And so it just so happened that someone found out about who, that I was coming to their school, and they, and they, they, they pretty much said, we need you to play. We, we have no one. You'll be, like, our best player, and, like, oh, flatter me. You know, kind of one of those things. And, uh, and so then I started playing football for the team. I absolutely hated it at first, all right? And uh, we would get pounded like 60 to nothing. And I just remember, like, it's not worth getting beat up every weekend and coming home just to the bruises and injuries. Like, this is not fun. And so they fired that coach, and then they brought in a new coach. And then that year, um, it was getting a little bit better. Um, you know, we were winning some games. really liked the guy. Like, he was – he just loved Jesus. He wasn't one of your typical football coaches that, you know, had like one of those you know, potty mouths, you know, really to get you going. Like he, he was a good man. He was a good mentor. He was a good friend of mine. Um, but then like I came into my junior year and uh, I was becoming even more serious about doing ministry. 
And what that really meant was more so my justification. Like, I didn't train during the off season. And so, like, I started becoming a little bit bigger. You know, I wasn't working out as much. And, you know, because I was so busy working in the church. Like, I had no time for any of that. And so I remember coming to the coaches and said, I quit. I'm done. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you're our starting center. Like, we, we, you're we don't have anyone else right now. It's like, well, you know, the Lord's calling me in something higher, you know, and I, I'm just got to feel his lead. And they're probably looking at me. It's like, yeah, this kid has not worked out whatsoever. Like they could see it. Like I, it was like my justification, right? Like, but I was like, no, I'm doing something more. And I remember my head coach, he pulled me in um, to this office and he said, and I was expecting him to, you know, to build me up to say how much of a great player that you were. And he looked at me and he said, Phil, you know the reason why I'm here, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I'm not here just to win football games, but I'm here to point all these football players to be able to know Jesus. And I'm counting on you to be able to be by my side, to be able to share that with others. I'm just like, dang it. I, 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 I thought I had, like, the perfect excuse to be able to leave. I really did. I was doing so, something so much better, or a higher calling, whatever you wanted. I already had a youth group, and I, I needed to be able to follow that. And it was, like, right in front of me, like, the Lord was saying, you need to stay. Like, there are men on this team that need to be able to hear about the love of Jesus, and to be able to, that you can be able to reflect your story to them. And you know what? I stayed, you know, I had to tough it out. It was a great season. But I realized if I did not do that, um, I would have never had some of, like, the greatest conversations with some of my brothers. And to be able to be in a dorm room late at night where we're talking about the meaning of life and where we're saying, oh, Jesus is so much better. Like, I would have never have had that if I decided just to quit and to walk away. I get that. That story right there may sound really cookie cutter. And you're like, wow, you just used a football story to be able to relate something like this, what Ruth has done. Um, like, that's, that's really nothing. And you're just like, it, it, because, like, if you get to the reality of it, you're like, well, like, my marriage, you know, um, it, it's awful. And, and let me tell you this, too, before I go into anything. Like, if someone... If, if your spouse is cheating on you, yes, that means for divorce, okay? I get that. Um, but it also means for forgiveness as well, um, which I know can be very tough. And, and especially if there is hurt or harm or affliction being done, you need to get out. You don't, need, you don't stay in that situation. So I want that to be out there as a disclaimer, okay? But, like, most of the time we also hear about these brokenness of relationships saying, that's just not there anymore, you know, it's just, the love's not there, you know, the, the girl at the office, it's just way more fun to talk to, you know, or whatever it may be, or I really don't like my job at all whatsoever, um, it's, it's awful, it's boring, you know, it's not, it's not fulfilling my purpose in life, and, and, and sometimes it's like, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but Paul, you know what he did for a profession? He was a tent maker, and he'll tell you he didn't like it whatsoever, okay? And so sometimes, and, and, and maybe, maybe there sh needs to be change, but also maybe God is also telling you to stay put in something, saying, hey, like, grind it out. Like, there, there's going to be something good that comes from this. Um, you just never know. There is a, a friend of mine, and um, just, just like a great mentor, for uh, me and Kyrie, and uh, for the longest time, um, he's just been a great encourager. I, I remember, like, when we received um, a phone call from John to be able to come down here and, and serve with you all at Thrive, um, he was, like, the very first person I shared this with. I said, hey, man, like, they, they want us to be here to do college ministry, to help plant this church. Like, this is so cool, and he was, like, I, I had to tell him because, like, he was that kind of brother to me. And um, because we had a cr uh, close relationship. And because, like, it led to one of those things where it wasn't like one of those Christian relationships, like, hey, how you doing? You know, how's your walk with the Lord? You know, what scripture are you reading? Which, like, all that stuff's really good. But, like, when it came to this guy, we went deep, 
right? We shared all of our brokenness. We shared all of our hurts. We shared all of our struggles. We shared all of our joys. We shared everything. Everything was on the table. And it really taught me a lot about relationship, friendship, discipleship, you know, being vulnerable, about walking my faith in the Lord. And I remember, like, things got real one time. He said, Phil, i got to talk to you about something. And I said, yeah, well, what's that? He said, I, I just want you to know that, um, you know, it was like, I think, 10 years ago from this time, like, I, I, had, an, I had an affair. And uh, I, I came clean and um, moved towards repentance and uh, counseling with my wife and, uh, um, and all of this stuff. And it, it was, it's, a, it's a huge struggle and still a huge pain for me to this day. And I remember we're just sitting there and we're like crying over this because like, like, because if you know his wife, she is such a beautiful individual and like she had every means to be able to leave, but she said, no, I'm going to stay. And they worked through it and, and it's something beautiful. And, and the thing is what I love about this couple is they love Jesus so much. And you can see that in how they communicate with other people, how they disciple their kids. And I'm just like, man, like that is so awesome. And, and I realize if, if she decided, you know, to say, hey, you know, I'm done, deuces. But instead she, she was just like, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to try to work this out. We're going to try, and, and they did. And, and I'll tell you what, like, I'm glad that they did because, like, there have been moments where I've needed them more than ever before. And it's, it's been something beautiful to see how God has worked through them. And it was all, I mean, she decided to stay. And I get that. That may be very difficult, may, very hard to come by. Um, again, maybe, maybe it's your job. Maybe you're just feeling so discouraged right now with what you're doing in life. Um, to all my millennials out there, where are you at? Hey, I'm a millennial too. Don't let this uh, um, disguise you. You know, we are never happy. You know, we're still trying to find the right job. You know, what is our meaning and purpose in life? Um, and, and believe me, we should, you know, we, we should be talking to all of our friends here and, you know, I'm sure you guys would have stories to be able to share with us all of what that's looked like for you. But, like, you know, we're, we're never really satisfied. We're always kind of like, what's next? And, and even that may be for yourself. Um, but maybe sometimes the Lord is actually calling us to stay put. Maybe there's something there that we don't know of. Um, I have a lot of love and respect for my mother, Okay. So she is a Christian um, school, um, preschool director. And she was like uh, also an assistant principal at school. Very large Christian school, very successful Christian school. It's where I went, love it. And I remember at one point um, she had a job offer to be a principal at another very prestigious school. And at all the, that time I was like, oh wow, that's like a good step up for you, mom. Like that's the right move. Um, I, she told me like how much money she was going to be making. I was thinking how much money is going to come towards me. I'm like, you should definitely take it, right? Like that's, that's the thing to do. And, um, but in the meantime, there was like a struggle going on where the school that she was already at, like there was problems with the pastor that was there and it, things were getting ugly and it was messy and I can't go into details of what was going on, but it was awful. It was like, like splitting the church, splitting the school, like everything was just going downhill fast. And I remember she said, I, I need to stay. And I remember my dad and I were like, what are you talking about? You need to get out of this situation. Like, here's, here's like the step up for you. You know, this is the next lateral move. And she was just like, no, no, I, I need to be able to stay. Um, I need to be able to love on the people that are in their staff to be able to move forward because something greater is going to come. And, and guess what? She did stay. Things got so much better. The school continued to grow. Um, but at the time, I was just like, what? In the world were you thinking? So there's two biblical figures in this story. Again, we have Ruth that, that does the crazy extraordinary thing, and she decides to stay. But then there's also Boaz, too. We don't give enough credit to Boaz, all right? He, he saw this lady, and he, he was changed by her story. But sometimes also, we need, maybe God's calling us to affirm someone out there if you hit that slide right there, Jeff. Uh, God is calling you to affirm when you see someone 
live out this kind of sacrificial love. So maybe you are like that Boaz and you see someone struggling and you see someone like really grinding out. Like maybe it's also our call as well to be able to come to the side of that individual and say, hey, whatever you need, let me take care of you. Um, it's, it's easy to try to put ourselves in Ruth. And I know that's really hard, but also we need to be Boazes out there as well. I'm not saying to go out and find someone and just marry them. That's not what I'm saying, but to be able to affirm that kind of sacrificial love, all right? So again, there are going to be moments where you are wanting, I mean, we're talking about a story where you need to be able to start something, where you are going to need to be able to stop whatever it may be. But guess what? There are also moments that we may need to stay. Galatians 6, 9 says this, and let us, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Sometimes, sometimes God's teaching us something and it's going to be hard and it's just like, it's just easy to change. And, and I'll tell you what, this church is, is still a new church. We've we're going to be an official church for three years from now. If I were to tell you the truth, how things have been going at times, um, I would say it's been very difficult. John would say the same thing too. It's like, oh my gosh, this is not working out. Let's quit. Let's jump ship. But no, we realize like God is doing something extraordinary in this, in this church, in this community. And, you know, we're going to continue to stay, stay faithful. And I wonder if we look at our time five years from now and look back like, wow, God, Look what you did. Remember that one time when it was really awful? You were still there, you know? <laughs> There's so many times I've had conversations with all of you. I really consider all of you some of my closest friends. And we're just like, we're sitting back there and crying like, oh my gosh, it was, this was happening. And now we're here and like, God is good. So maybe sometimes he's calling us to stay. even if it gets tough, even if it's tough in our marriages, our job, our circumstances. He's calling us to stay. So what, what does that look like for you? What does that mean for you? I just pray that we can kind of reflect upon this throughout our weeks. You know, if you have that note card there, do you still have your, your, your note card? Of course you do. That's awesome. Um, write, 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 it, write it down. You know, what, what, maybe there's been so much, you know, you've been so discouraged and saying, okay, what, what is God really saying to us right now? What does it look like? You know, are there things that we need to stay put on? You know, what does that mean? Um, or where do we need to start? Where do you stand? Because ultimately, and, and Guy is going to be talking about this next week, that we are God's masterpiece. And he uses the brokenness of our story for his greater redemption. And that's good news. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're, thankful, we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done. And... Uh, Lord, sometimes it's, it's, it's very difficult to be able um, to see you in action. So sometimes we're like, maybe there's a, a big move that we need to make or something needs to change because we're discouraged. But Lord, may we discern like Ruth did and, and do the impossible and maybe do something that's crazy, but ultimately that's so good and so sacrificial in the same way that you would do things, Father. Um, so Lord, um, if that's our relationships or our job or whatever circumstance that may be, may you show us where we may need to stay and what that looks like. Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise.